thank you all for coming uh, to my talk, Airflow at Burns & McDonnell, Orchestration from Zero to 100. Um, I'm Bonnie Y. I'm a data engineer at Burns & McDonnell, and I started about a year ago with no data engineering experience. Um, during my tech career so far, I've worked on front-end, CSS, to iOS mobile development, and uh, APIs with Java Spring Boot. Um, my, my work with APIs really made me interested in um, digging deeper into the data. So when I got um, the opportunity to work as a data engineer at Burns & McDonnell, I jumped on it. <laughs> my spare time, I like to do everything, and this is my dog. She's very cute, I miss her. All right, so today we're going to talk about a few things. First, we're gonna start with setting the landscape of data at Burns & McDonnell, who we are, how we use our data, and what platform we're building. And then we're going to go talk about how we achieve the goal of ingesting a new source system from when you got the ticket to, uh, to getting into the next part of the pipeline within one day, utilizing Airflow. And then after that, I'm gonna tell you exactly why Airflow is the right tool for what we're doing. All right. First, about Burns & McDonnell. We are a full-service architecture, engineering, and construction firm. We were started in 1898 by two civil engineering majors, and over the years, we've had the opportunities to take on some of the industry's toughest challenges. We get to work on some very impactful projects. We are over 14,000 professionals, including contractors, craft workers, and yes, software developers. We go where our clients are and have uh, offices in almost every major city in the United States. We have been named number seven of the top 500 um, design firms in engineering news record. Trust me, that is a big deal. And something that really sets us apart is we're 100% employee owned. We get to uh, work on impactful projects such as the Ivanpah Solar Thermal Facility, which uh, doubles the world's existing sol solar thermal capacity, and more recently, the Lunar Productions and Operations Center for in Intuitive Machines. If you didn't hear, in February, they launched the first trip to the lunar surface that successfully transmitted engineering and science data back to NASA since Apollo 17 in 1972. So that's pretty cool. <laughs> All right, setting the scene. This is where we're starting. Data at Burns & McDonnell is a central part of our business because not only does it help us win and um, deliver for our clients, it also helps our business build awesome things for the world. <clears throat> Since we've been around for so long, we've had to make many decisions to use our data um, in um, an ad hoc way. So first of all, that makes things hard to maintain. As a result of this pattern of building things ad hoc, we now have many more systems than we can effectively handle. Um, SaaS products, cloud, Excel, you name it. Each one of these has their own strengths and challenges, which can often be obscured by the teams having built systems that are generally not in regular contact with each other. It makes it hard to trust, because the side effect of working this way is we now have more than one tool or report that are essentially doing the same thing. To this point, it's a pattern because it's hard to find what's already out there. Development teams need solutions, and if you don't know something is already there and you don't know where to find or who to ask, then you're gonna make something the same. It also makes it unclear if our data is actually correct, in sync with all the other systems because everything is so um, disconnected from each other. We are also very hard to change. Um, the lack of visibility into what our data is and where it's being used leads to having a lot of moving parts and pieces that have built around the, been built around these systems. They are very coupled and without a proper understanding of what's being used by who, how often, you can't really change something when you don't know what's going to be effective. On top of all that, we don't have a very consistent testing and observability structure that can help us make sure that if we do change something, it's not going to break something important. But let's stop talking about all that, because we have a plan. All is not lost. So we stepped back and we took a look at what do we actually need our data platform to do for us? What do we need it to be? So we need it to be scalable, naturally. Um, <clears throat> 
we're only growing because that is the nature of nearly any business. So we know this isn't the threshold and it's important that our platform can scale not only for technology, but also for the business as we accumulate new use cases and offerings. This data needs to be centralized, so anyone who needs it can access it and use it, and it also needs to be maintainable for our developers so we can keep up with the high demand that we're already seeing and will only get more of. We need our data to be reliable, because in order for our data consumers to trust our data sets, we need to have a shared language so we can com have conversations with each other to understand our data better and ensure we're using the right data for the right use case. It should be obvious where it came from so we can be confident that our data is accurate, secure, and actually what we need. And then, of course, we need it to be evolvable. We need a system that is composable to allow us to swap out various parts and pieces and technologies that will work better for us if we need them to. Software is constantly changing, growing, and becoming more efficient, not that I need to say it. So by keeping this in mind, we can enable our platform to keep up to date with emerging tech and allow ourselves to expand our use cases to do whatever we want, no matter how big. So now that we know what we're aiming for, let's talk about how. We are building a modern cloud-based data platform, and so the first piece of our platform is the ingestion layer. It's responsible for connecting the source systems to the source systems and bringing data into the platform. Airflow is handling part of this, but we are also doing the rest of it in Databricks. The next piece is the storage layer. It stores data. Who would have thought? Uh, more detailed though, Airflow lands raw data as close to the source system format as possible into an Azure blob storage container that we call the landing zone. It, of course, makes the data available for the processing layer. This is where required business logic takes place, and it reads from, it reads from the data storage, processes it, and transforms it so that we can use it for our business use cases. This is done in Databricks with Delta Lives tables and a data build tool better known as DBT. We'll then use the serving layer to deliver that output to our clients and people who need to use it, the data consumers. Um, we're also using Olation to catalog and document our data and everything about it, so everyone will have a better understanding of what they need, what it is, make sure that they're using it correctly. On top of that is the operational metadata layer. Uh, it captures information about ingested and processed data and other state of various systems that may or may not talk to each other directly. Um, it rolls up to a centralized monitoring system for better observability. And we can't stop, I mean, of course, we need the orchestration layer with Airflow. As opposed to the metadata layer, this layer is an action-oriented uh, component. It controls and keeps track of the complex data flows that have multiple interdependencies. All right, we know what we're doing, and we're, we're ready to get going. So we have to start somewhere. We picked one of the most important systems for our business, um, and it's backed by an Oracle database. Um, for this system, we, um, the requirements state that we need to ingest somewhere around 1,500 tables from the Oracle system and have complete one-to-one -one parity with the current state functionality so that we can swap everything out behind the scenes without anyone knowing. Another piece to highlight is for our data platform overall, not just the source system, we want to be able to ingest <coughs> a source system from the time you get the ticket with the requirements all the way into our processing layer within one day, ideally quicker. And that is where we begin, starting at zero. All right, so let's rewind a little to a over a year ago when I first started, it's my first day at Burns and McDonnell, my boss comes up to me and says, get the company training over with first, come find me and I'll show you what you get to work on. So after a grueling eight hour day of company training, yes, I did do that all in one day, <laughs> um, I, he gave me this POC uh, and showed me what I was working on. All right, so this is the code. It was very fun to look at. I had literally never heard about Airflow before this moment, um, and pi my Python was a bit rusty because I didn't use it at my previous role, but what better way to learn something? This POC didn't just include a couple of starter DAGs, it also had the start to a configuration-driven pattern that we were shooting for. But first things first, I needed to understand what I was looking at. So 
For those of you familiar with Airflow, which is most likely all of you, uh, you can probably lapse into a mini coma right now while I explain the basics of this, uh, of a DAG, but just in case some of you don't know, um, a DAG means directed acyclical graph, which basically means the flow of whatever we're doing can only go in one direction. DAGs are made up of tasks, which, which execute uh, operators that are the blueprints of what we want the task to do. The operators have other Python code and hooks, which is an airflow concept that's basically just how you can interact with external systems. Many hooks and operators are provided by the community to interact with common tools and have functionality to do that built in. All right, so this is the DAG code. We're looking at that DAG that I was given. Um, so after, after briefly reading up uh, in the Airflow documentation, I was able to parse this code. Um, and this is how you create a DAG. You need a couple of required, there's a couple of required pieces that you need. First off, the DAG ID, which is basically just a um, name. So you can go look at the Airflow UI, your DAG, and you know which one you're looking at. A schedule interval, so it tells the scheduler what time to run the DAG, when to run the DAG, and how often. It can also be none if you only need to do it whenever you want. And then um, we also have the start date, which tells the DAG how far back the um, data it's handling needs to be, like it needs to be worried about what data, data it's handling. That was a tongue twister. All right, <clears throat> the last thing you need is a task. The most common operators are the bash operator and the Python operator, and we talked about that earlier. Um, so when we started, we just used the Python operator to run a simple Python function. Um, we used the Oracle hook, as mentioned, uh, to communicate with our Oracle system and bring back query results and print them to the log to make sure what we were doing was working, our connection really. <clears throat> We also had another starting DAG that did similar things with um, a dummy uh, parquet file landing into the Azure um, landing zone blob storage so we could test that our connection worked. So now we needed to tackle um, converting to parquet. Uh, we chose to use a custom operator, uh, mostly because I had just read data pipelines with Apache Airflow and I was really excited to start extending the functionality and learning how things worked more deeply. Um, to drive the concept home, here's an overview of how our copy operator worked. Each one of these boxes, fetch, convert, upload, has to wait for the previous box to complete before it can move on to the next one. To build your own custom operator, you need to extend the base operator class. And the only thing you need to include is an execute method. So the task knows what to do when the time comes for it to run. Our first step for getting the data uh, is we created a private function to get source data out of our Oracle system. We use the Oracle hook just like in our POC, which provides pandas functionality out of the box. So utilizing pandas, we receive the query results which come back as a data frame and return that to our next step, which is to convert it to Parquet. Pandas has that functionality out of the box, so we just used that. Um, luckily, it made it really easy. <clears throat> However, we did have a few hiccups. Weird UTF-8 problems and data type issues, um, which we all tracked down to being an Oracle version error and a Python version error, and they just weren't talking to each other well. Um, it was a headache, but we have since created a different solution in Polars, which is much more consistent, but we still have issues. And, um, you know, that's just the way things are sometimes. And then, of course, naturally, we have to upload it to the landing zone here. This private function, I didn't show it, but it's similar to that POC where we just landed things into the, into the landing zone. Okay, so now, now that I know more, I am absolutely not convinced that I would make the decision to use a custom operator, especially the way we set it up. It got really big and complicated really fast, and it's basically just a DAG inside of an operator um, it's really cool that you can do this when needed, but I think that using the TaskFlow API is a much better fit for our purposes. It's way simpler and easier to maintain with that lower cognitive load. It's really just a Python function, and you just gotta throw an annotation on top of it, and then it, it becomes a task. Much easier to test, also. So that brings us to our generator pattern. As I hinted in the first part of this, the POC included a set of files to create a DAG generator based on YAML-defined configurations. 
This pattern is awesome, and many teams have implemented it, each with their own style. It makes it stupid easy to add a new table or DAG to our code base with only a couple of line changes or copy and pasting a previous defined YAML config uh, file. <clears throat> So after several rounds of R&D with the team, here's where we stand with the YAML configuration. It has changed a lot. I can only imagine it's gonna have more stuff added to it later. All right, this block allows us to specify the DAG configuration properties. As I was talking about in the beginning, it can help us to decide what those required pieces are and then override some of those default airflow con configurations as needed. Um, then this block is a straightforward connection block. It references the connection IDs that live in our Azure Key Vault. Um, since we moved to holding our connections in the Key Vault, it's so much better than putting them in the UI every time you start up your Airflow. <clears throat> and then we wanted to add the queries as their own individual tasks. Originally, we defined the full query in line, select star from whatever table, but as soon as we started creating the incremental loads and adding where clauses and all sorts of other stuff to it, it became really hard to read, so we decided to pull those out into externally defined SQL files, and um, changing this, so changing this format also allows us to, instead of, um, have to manually create tags, we can now just utilize what we have in our config to create tags based on those table names. So when you're in that UI, Airflow UI, you can just filter based on your table and find exactly which DAG are using or controlling those queries to that table. It's been really great for debugging. Last, our block here is just for kind of other information. It's like a batch property, almost like metadata. Um, but we really do utilize this mostly to make the landing zone um, location down the line. Um, okay, and now we come to the DAG config class. So in order to get anything out of those YAML configs that we've defined, we need to have some way to communicate with it. So we've made this class. It um, allows us to extract values out of the config definition. So we can plug them in or use them when we use them in the, them in the generator. <laughs> and we also have other utility methods in here. As mentioned, the get tags one will automatically apply tags based on your tables that are defined in the config. And then we also do default args now, um, which cut down a lot on the top level Python code we were using in that generator, um, which actually was really making our schedule run not as good. And here is the main event, the generator. Uh, okay, so first we defined a function that we wanted to call in a loop for each of the DAG configs that we had defined. Then we use the DAG configs classes utilities to get the config files and then call it in a loop down here. We add all of those um, files that it found into the Python globals, um, which is just how we figured out how to do it. I was watching an old, um, not old, a previous Airflow Summit video, and I don't know where my notes are for it, but they did a lot better because they could use the airflow testing thing out of the, f out of the box, which doesn't work with this for some reason. And then, after that, we call the properties from the config and construct our DAG. Each um, task will then be created to execute the copy operator. So three months later, We've got our DAG generator pattern figured out, and Airflow is up and running very consistently. We started to be able to move on to building our Databricks piece and um, just have to do some, sort, some optimizations and maintenance on Airflow. Um, so when we started going there, we actually ran into some challenges working together as a team. All right, when we implemented Airflow, we were working with a vendor team in India. Um, it was mostly just me and one of their developers, shout out to Siva, who was awesome. Um, that, and we were working together very closely on the same parts of the code. Um, of course, they had tighter deadlines than we did. We both couldn't get our Airflow setup done on local development. I got it working for a while on mine, but then I had trouble with my M1 Mac and Docker and who knows. So we needed something faster. Um, the platform team had put on our Kubernetes development environment, which was working awesome. So upon merging to develop, it deploys to the development environment. And so we did something that makes me feel really itchy. Um, we would just deploy develop straight YOLO right into develop. 
um, to see our changes and debug through all of the typos and all of that stuff. Uh, it was horrible. Um, we'd come in, in the morning and be like, what happened to what I changed yesterday? So at the very least, I put on PR requirement to open a PR so everyone can see what was changed. Then you could just merge it in whenever you wanted to. Still didn't like it, but it, was, it is what it is. It was working. But we started having new team members come onto the team. This is when this is not going to be helpful. So we needed to find something that would be a little bit more easy to work on with others. And we figured it out. Um, deploy to sandbox, the answer to all our woes. I know this means nothing to anyone else in this room, but it was really um, a savior of ours. <laughs> it's a Git tag that we utilized to deploy to our um, sandbox environment, just like we did with a merge to de develop, a PR merge to develop. We now do a push to this tag, we'll deploy to the sandbox environment. So how it works is super duper easy. You just commit your code. Um, force tag it because someone else probably already has that tag and then force push that tag up to the sandbox environment. So as you can as you can see here, force push is what we want. We want everything to be replaced by the active developer's code, but <laughs> just same thing. You can step on each other's toes without proper communication. Since our team is kind of small still, um, we are able to communicate well, but it's still not sustainable. Um, so hoping to learn some things about local uh, airflow, spinning up local airflow here so I can bring that back. We have some weird things that makes it hard. Um, and then we also have introduced ephemeral environments, which are a game changer. So every time you open a PR to develop, it'll spin up a um, an environment that's exactly like develop. So me as a developer, I can go through and check to make sure my changes haven't broken anything else and that it's working like I need it to. And then once I merge my PR in, it'll spin it down and just be gone. They're really great. Okay, so we have things going great. The tasks are running consistently because of our generator pattern. We're able to make changes because we know how to work as a team a little bit better. And I'd say we're definitely halfway to our goal. So let's, we now have the opportunity to check in with our DAGs and see what's happening with them. But, hmm, okay. That DAG is taking over 30 hours to complete. Uh, why? <laughs> Okay, so we needed to figure out what was happening because this is unacceptable. Going back to that visual from earlier uh, about our copy operator, let's break down what was happening. Most of the tables are small, so it's not always an issue, but when running historical loads of gigantic tables, we were seeing those 30 plus hour DAG runs. This happened because at this fetch step, it needs to load the entirety of the table records from that large table before it can even move on. So that was taking, anything that was even slightly bigger than those tiny tables was taking longer than an hour. We used that for our basic measurement, like unofficially. So in the next conversion step, it has to wait for the entirety of the records to be returned. And then it has to convert the entirety of the records. All of that makes it take even longer. And then, of course, we have to upload that gigantic file into the blob storage landing zone. Um, that didn't take as long, but this huge file implicates that we're going to have large problems down the line in our Databricks environment with trying to parse and work with this thing. So that, those problems will then just trickle all the way down. <clears throat> we need to fix it. So we tried chunking. We introduced just grabbing a chunk uh, batch size from the Oracle Hooks functionality. You can just add a batch size in there. So we just started pulling only 100,000 records at a time. The same process would have to happen each one after the other, still for each one of those um, 100,000 uh, records. But it was happening um, a lot quicker. The upfront cost was a lot, um, a lot quicker performance. Um, however, you still have to wait for all the records to be returned before the DAG can be done, before the task can be done, um, which was still taking a long time. So the next thing we knew what we needed to do is we needed to parallelize those um, queries. That is such a hard word. <laughs> okay, to further optimize, we're going to call each of those chunks in parallel. Enter partial expand. Partial expand is a way that Airflow gives us out of the box to parallelize queries. 
First, for the task, we want to run in parallel. You just add an expand call to the bottom, and you can tell it how many tasks it needs to build. Um, it can be a list of things or a number, but the way we're using it is we are handing it a list of tuples that are made of dates, um, which I call buckets, that have like a certain number of days. So our huge table can be then applied, those two dates can then be applied to the where clause of that huge table, and then those chunks will you know, run off a last updated date and then go at the same time. Partial allows you to specify parameters that will be used again, used across all of the parallelized tests. So all of the items in this operator's init method is essential for our data to be processed correctly. So this allows us to blanket add those things to every one of the tests that we create from that expand. When we first introduced this, it was interesting to see how it showed up in the UI. Normally, I'll click on the little grid uh, task and it'll come up with just like the details, but you have to check this mapped task to be able to see any details about a specific task that was built from the parallel query. Um, but you can now see all of them that ran and then you can look at each individual one to see if there are any that are not performing like you want. Like this one is two minutes and the rest of them are like seven seconds. So maybe that's a problem. Maybe that's something we need to look into. But you can also see all sorts of details about these parallel DAGs. Um, just like you do when you want to see more details, you can click on this and then click the more details button. And now we have a view of all of the date tuples that were created from our function that makes the, the buckets. So we can set, see which ones were run and track down which one might be the one that's taking longer. Um, something that I learned recently though is you can actually change the map index value here. Instead of showing a zero index list of numbers, you can pass in a dictionary. So maybe we could put our date tuple in here and then more easily be able to tell which date is having an issue. This is great, it works. Um, but the next problem is we actually have small tables, like I said. We don't want the generator to make parallel queries for each one of these tiny tables. That's also going to be a performance issue because our Oracle instance is actually capped at 24 concurrent spots. So <laughs> if, we're, if we're cutting up these small tables that we don't need, then it's just going to make that take longer too. And I don't know, it's just a horrible mess. So next thing that we did is we implemented a strategy pattern. Um, I decided this would be a good thing to choose because I was familiar with the gang of four software development patterns, and this is one of those. It lets you define a set of functions in separate classes to make their objects interchangeable at runtime. So an example of this, you have to get to the airport because you're speaking at Airflow Summit. You could drive or you can order an Uber or you could walk for some strange reason, but each of these modes of transportation has different ways that you can get to the airport. I wake up and I go to drive and my car's been stolen. Uh-oh, I gotta change how I'm gonna get there. So now I call an Uber. I, why would I call the cops? I'm gonna call an Uber so I can get to Airflow Summit. And so that's how I was able to switch it basically at runtime. Here is a um, view of how that's all built together. It's made up of a few different components, the first one being the context. This is the main class, and it holds a reference to any one of those concrete strategies that can then delegate tasks to it. The client can select and pass the desired strategy into that context, which has a common interface to interact with. So each of these concrete strategies will implement that interface fetch, it says fetch data method, and um, it keeps the context unaware of the specific algorithm details. It means you don't have to change that context and you don't have to change, and you can add a new concrete strategy whenever you want. Um, here's the pieces in our code base. Uh, the retriever is our context, fetch strategy, our interface, and then those are, all, of course, are our concrete strategies there. And this is what the code looks like. There's our retriever. Um, you first have to set this up by having a way to get the, to call the actual strategy here. So that way, whenever we are using this in a generated way, we can just call the strategy that it's already set. Um, and then you have a, a setter that you need to be able to change it so you can change it very easily. And then 
uh, after that, you need to create a generic um, fetch data method that's just going to call that concrete strategies fetch data. <laughs> this looks redundant. And um, I think a lot of people would say, uh, why do we need to do this? But if you don't do it like this, then the implemented concrete strategies we'd have to handle all of the differences in this part instead of in the concrete part. So the redundancy is just gonna be something we have to live with. Here's one of those concrete strategies. This is where you just define that varied functionality there and um, that way you can just, just decide utilizing the arguments you pass in, how you're gonna handle them later. Uh, we have three right now. This is just our generic SQL strategy, but then we also have an incremental SQL strategy, which lets us use it for incremental daily loads, and then we have the date interval strategy that utilizes those buckets. In order to tell our generator that it needs to parallelize the queries, we have utilized our config yet again, and we've put in a new block that's a predicate block. Um, it, you can uh, define a min date, a max date, and you tell it how big you want your bucket. And um, in the DAG config, I'll show you in a second, that's where we decide which one to use. Um, this is really hard coded though, so there's definitely more room to optimize. Uh, we're gonna do like a, a preliminary query to get the most optimized size of the buckets because this one, uh, you just kind of have to guess and check. And then having that max date at the bottom, we actually saw with that huge, um, table that we were talking about uh, for the need for this. Um, because we've hard-coded that last date, and now the last bucket has just been getting bigger and bigger. Mm, we don't want that. <laughs> Here's that um, DAG config code again that tells that this is how we can switch our strategy based on some of those um, uh, config parameters and values that we've set. More benefits of this pattern is you can fully unit test it without having to deal with the airflow context, which has been the hardest part for me. And it decouples it from specific DAGs for reusability. It's awesome. All right, so we've done a ton. Let's recap. We've created a generator pattern that works well. We know how to work as a team. We've fixed some of our performance issues and we are utilizing software back best practices to keep our code more clean and extensible. It's nice to just see things working, but isn't Airflow supposed to orchestrate stuff? Well, yes, we need Airflow to actually be the orchestrator of our pipelines. Airflow, uh, since we are using Databricks downstream, we, ha we can thank the Airflow community yet again for having a provider package to interact with Databricks. Um, we already have that, so Let's get this show on the road. <clears throat> it's fast, it's awesome. It runs after all the tasks have completed. All of the boilerplate code is written in the operator provided by the Air Airflow Databricks package. We have set up a number of jobs downstream and using this operator is as simple as defining the Databricks connection ID and the job name that you want to run after everything has been successful. Then we can also add notebook parameters. Because of this, it makes it so powerful we can do this. Because in our Databricks jobs, we can use parameters to tell Databricks where to go looking for the files. So we have utilized a couple of our utility methods here to um, feed in the correct values for Databricks to be able to find stuff. Uh, we can do this because of user-defined macros. Uh, I was excited to find out this functionality exists because I, I was having trouble trying to figure out how we were gonna do the environment switching because our landing zone changes per environment. And this is awesome. It's um, a concept where you can just make a, um, a named parameter for a function that you can then utilize inside of your task inside the Jenja templates, which are also awesome. Um, okay, ba, 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 ba. lost my place. All right, here's where our DAG is now. Um, obviously, I should have added a little more uh, task there because we have more than one. But um, after that task is finished, this Databricks uh, run task goes, and it's been successful. Uh, the coolest thing about this is it actually links it directly to the Databricks job run. So whether it's successful or failure, you can go see exactly which Databricks job ran, um, which really makes it easy for debugging and traceability. 
After wiring this up, I was able to get a new table ingested in under 45 minutes. That work required me to create a new DAG, a new Databricks job, a new DLT pipeline, and add new tables. Um, <clears throat> with our generator pattern, it was very powerful for us um, to be able to do all that. And I also had to talk with people and coordinate and get clarity on things um, before completing it. <clears throat> 45 minutes. But I'm convinced it was actually more like 25 minutes of active development. And here we are. We've met our goal um, as a few weeks ago. We're firmly going exactly how fast we want to go. Do you think we can go faster? I do. So now it's time to orchestrate everything. And Justin isn't the only thing Airflow should be handling. It should be handling, it should know about everything. And now we can swift, shift all of the orchestration tools from Active Batch, Informatica, everything else, and put it into Airflow. There are a lot of things we can explore to make this a reality, but I've got a few things on my personal roadmap. Um, Config-driven APIs. So we have um, an API use source we're already ingesting right now, and of course most of our SaaS products are APIs. Um, so we're just doing a standalone DAG, and we have like each one as an API call, but we've abstracted out talking to the SaaS product with a custom Python library, so all of that business logic and stuff can change in that API client. Um, when stepping back to look at the DAG we've got now, um, I uh, noticed that all you have to do is pass it the name, so I think we can do this. Another one is external task sensors for our silver layer processing jobs in Databricks. We have um, separate jobs that run on staggered schedules and DBT jobs, um, but I want to be able to get it to a point where when the tables are finished ingesting, then it can kick off that DBT job. Um, I've done a little bit of work with this, but I have not gotten to scratch the surface more than the surface yet. And then, of course, improved DLT job integration. Um, Delta Live tables, I think it's kind of new, and the Databricks job run operator does not allow us to pass parameters into the DLT pipeline, mostly because of DLT. It doesn't have any concept into what the job is, so it doesn't know what parameters that job has. Um, the submit run operator also doesn't do what we want, so I'm hoping to be able to go down the path of figuring out how to do this. And then it might be an opportunity for me to contribute back to the community. We're not at the finish line yet, so this is a misnomer, but we're definitely on our way. Um, I just want to break down why Airflow is great. It makes us scalable due to its code-first, developer-centric architecture. Since everything is written in Python, it allows us to use common software development best practices like version control and new stuff like ephemeral environments. And that functionality provided out of the box let us set up this awesome pattern with relatively low overhead. It, Airflow makes us reliable because of its efficient scheduling and resilience. It's been going cons consistently for a long while now with few interruptions. Every, time, every now and then we'll have an intermittent failure, but we've included retries, which has m largely mitigated that, and we haven't even started to leverage SLA call callbacks to alert us. And Airflow allows us to be evolvable due to its active and dedicated community. I mean, 10 years, we heard that keynote. There are so many improvements happening frequently, not only to the base code, but also to the provider packages, which makes it easy for us to onboard new solutions with technologies we're not already using. Undoubtedly, that's where we're going to continue to see people pick up and make packages for any new tools that come up on the scene. So we've barely scratched the surface. That's my conclusion here. Um, there's so much more we could do, so many more tools and techniques to dive into. And that's where I'm hoping we get to do next.